Welcome, everyone. We have a little smaller group today, which makes it a little more fun because we can be a little bit more interactive. So I have kind of some boundaries here that I will stay within so everybody is aware of where I am and whatnot. Everyone should have an orange folder. This is all yours to keep. And I will just let you know a little bit about what's in it. We're not going to go through every item here. On the left-hand side, hopefully, all these have been put together correctly and in the same way. We do have an evaluation form, so we would appreciate some feedback at the end of the session and just give us an idea of how well we've done or if there was something we missed, so on and so forth. Then we have what's called the 2023 Medicare Cost Sheet. It's a blue sheet. We're going to speak to that as well. Know that Medicare has not made the announcement yet of all the 2024 numbers yet. We're, we're anxiously awaiting how that's going to change. And chances are it will go up. Then we have a pink sheet. And this is going to help us differentiate between the kinds of supplemental plans we can choose from. So more to come on that. We have a colored sheet here. It's green. Chris has also sent you all of this information. Those of you on the webinar, you may not have a colored sheet, but these same documents are also included for you. Once you're fully on Medicare, the green sheet goes on to tell you that you can set up an account. So this is where you can see your claims. You can see when the next time you need to do a tetanus shot, so on and so forth. So it's really more of a reference tool down the road. Last sheet is referred to as the helpful online resources. So we have Medicare and we have Social Security that often uh, intertwine. So let me explain. Medicare is what you're eligible for when you turn 65. And some people are eligible for Medicare because they are disabled. So then they are eligible 25 months later. When you do turn 65, and we have a few folks that have indicated that's forthcoming, it is important to determine what you need to do or not do. So we are going to address that. If you're working, you might go one route. If you're not working, you might go another route. But know that when you do turn 65, it always is a good idea to take a hard look at what is it that I need to do. So today's topic is going to be the open enrollment, otherwise known as the annual election period. And it does start October 15. So it's coming up in a matter of three or four days and will be off and running. A little bit more about me. I've been helping people now for the last 18 years. I work with my husband, Ron Corser. He's founded Cornerstone Retirement Partners. We also have a staff of about five or six other people that participate in both the health care planning. And as Chris said, whether you're Medicare eligible or if you're under 65, we help with the marketplace or Obamacare. But we've got a health team that's comprised of four other people, and then we've got the wealth side of the business. So our claim to fame is to connect the health and the wealth, because a lot of people want to work hand in hand with the same organization. But if not, we're here to be able to help you with the health side of things. So on the right side is our Medicare planning, and it's a multi-page document. No, actually, it's one page. This is the agenda that we are going to go through. Again, I'm not going to go through it item by item. And then we also have some, let's avoid some mistakes during the annual enrollment. So a lot of information. Again, I'm going to touch upon what I think is most important. If there is something that doesn't make sense as we go through it, please, for those of you that are on a webinar, just you know, put it in the chat or raise the hand, and then we're going to address that question because chances are someone else might have the same. So we're going to back up here, and I am physically going to do that, and show you that Medicare has different enrollment periods, okay? It's important to understand what each one is, okay? Because we kind of have some combinations in the room here. So today, the emphasis is actually on the annual election period. It also goes by the name open enrollment, kind of synonymous. So when you hear open enrollment, technically it's called the annual election period, so we abbreviated in our office with AEP, and it strictly adheres to this point in time. So we meet with people between 1015 and 127, and if anybody makes a change, and that's the purpose of it, okay, it has to be done during that period of time, all right? So we are off and running with lots of appointments. We're a lot like a CPA starting the 15th. We just go nonstop. We work six days a week. 
everybody helps, pitches in, et cetera, et cetera. But very, very busy because this is the time that people say, I didn't like what I had. Is there something else? I was fine with what I had, but I don't understand the changes. Would you explain those to me? So on and so forth. So we are there always as a resource in the fall. And that is something we always tell people. We're not a one and done. We are here to help you every fall with whether or not you want to make a change or you just have a couple of questions. So we are going to delve into this in a little bit more detail. But what we also have is the initial enrollment period. So let me just tell you that. If you are in your initial enrollment period, and I think we have a couple folks that might fit this criteria, you get only one of these. And it is determined by whether or not you decide to take it. So some people don't take the initial enrollment period because they're still working, okay? So your initial enrollment is seven months. For those of you turning 65, you get bombarded with information. Oh my gosh, they between phone calls and stuff in the mail, it's unbelievable. If you were to read through a lot of the material, they would tell you that you have a seven month window to start to make decisions, okay? Now, what they don't exactly tell you is if you are on social security, and I don't think anyone here is, you do automatically get enrolled in Medicare Part A and B. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what these actually mean and there is a cost associated with Part B. So if somebody is collecting Social Security, the enrollment's automatic. If somebody is not collecting, you actually have a seven-month window to evaluate everything and enroll in it online. So for those of you that fit this criteria, I would highly recommend that you have set up a Social Security account, okay? Okay. Now, I mentioned it briefly, but we have Social Security and we have Medicare. So Medicare is the health insurance when you're first eligible. And Social Security does the enrollment for Medicare. And they collect the Part B premium. So that's the role that they play, okay? So sometimes people aren't sure which one does what. Medicare, health insurance, they're going to determine whether you're eligible for a particular process, procedure, surgery, so on and so forth but it really is social security you're working with on the front end and they are the ones that are gonna collect the Part B premium. So if you're not on social security and you were to do something, we would first want to know what your birth date was. So I'm just gonna make this one up and say it's 310-1958. Well, that person is already though, 65, right? I need 59, right? Okay. So this person, this is their birth month. It's always effective the first of the month, unless you're born on the first of the month, okay? So people that might have been born on March 1st, they actually have it effective February 1st, okay? It doesn't happen very often, but once in a while. But this particular person, if they were going to enroll in Medicare Part A or A and B, they would literally have the opportunity to start the enrollment in December, okay? So that's really all the window is showing you. It's saying we're going to give you a 90-day period of time to get it together to figure out what it is that you really want to do, okay? So some folks have elected to, because they are still working, okay? And the guideline for the still working is this. If you're still working and there's 20 or more employees, you don't have to sign up for Part B. We do recommend you sign up for Part A as long as you're not on an HSA, okay? So if any of this becomes a little tricky, you certainly can always call me or send me an email. But what we will say to people is, are you working? Yes, I am. Are there more than 20 employees? Yes, there is. So technically, you don't have to sign up for A or B. But if you do not participate in an HSA, we do highly recommend you sign up for an A because the A will get you in the Medicare Social Security system and it will be a lot easier for when you need to apply for Part B, okay? So a lot of people will sign up for Part A. Again, they're going to go through their Social Security account. They can approach this on the first 
of this month. So even though this person was born on March 10, they don't have to wait till December 10. They could literally put on their calendar, I want to get on the first day of the first month here, and they could go ahead and make that decision for Part A or Part A and B. And again, right now, we're kind of talking about those that are still working, okay? So far, so good? Makes sense? Still working and has health insurance. Yes, that is correct. We're making an assumption that the group plan that you have is still acceptable. And, and as Chris said before, people will say, well, I don't know if my health insurance is going to be as good as Medicare, okay? And we can certainly evaluate that. And then you wouldn't sign up for anything. What you would do is you'd give us a call. And it could even be here in November, right, or October. Allow yourself enough time to actually start to learn about it. Now, some of the employer plans, they'll come out in October or November, and then you've got to make decisions. So you just quickly pick up the phone and say, you know what, I'm still working, but I guess I don't know if mine is as good at, or not, okay? But we will go through that with you. And if we think it's better for you to stay in the group plan and you agree, then that's exactly where you stay. And if you say, I'm not at an HSA, we can even help you with the enrollment in A. We'll do it for you right online in the office. But you have to have a Social Security account set up. I can't set that account up for you. Yep. Okay. All right. Sure. It is not effective until 3-1. So they give you that time to make some decisions as to do I want A only and then it's 3-1 or do I want A and B and then it's also 3-1, okay? So a person who comes to see me who has a card with two different dates, they've gone ahead and turned this on at age 65 and now they have another date is an indic indication that they continued to work because now they're going to get a special election period, okay? So the special election period applies to people who are still eligible for Medicare, but they are continuing to work. There were 20 or more employees. So they get a special election period. I had a gentleman call me yesterday. He said, I'm calling because I lost my job. He said, I had no idea this was going to happen. He said, and I didn't plan on retiring until next year. I am Medicare eligible. My insurance is going to end at the end of, of October. Please help me. What do I do? I need to get my Part B pronto, okay? So we generally say in order to get your Part B, ideally, you want 45 to 60 days. Who wants that period of time? That is Social Security. And believe me, they will quote it back to you when you call. They'll say, you know what, we do have 60 days to process this. Now, the good news is in his particular case, he already has Part A. So it's going to make it a whole lot easier that he's already in the system, and the two of you, you've told me that too, to get his Part B. Otherwise, the process is that much longer. So he has to make fast tracks of getting two forms. The two forms are from the government. One is called the CMS 560, I think it's seven. It might be four. This particular form is the employer form. And he went to his employer and they filled it out. First section was his. The second section was the employer. And it says, this is when you were hired. And this is when it ended. And it says, this is when your health insurance started, and this is when your health insurance ended. And it will encompass the period of time that he turned 65, okay? Now, in his particular case, he has two employers. So he's going to have to go back to the one where he was 65, and he's, he's in a little tough spot right now because he's not even sure they're in business. But that's we'll work through it. So once he has those two forms, okay, he will then find his Part A card, which I know he has, and then he will also fill out the 40B. So both of these forms I have in the office. You can always request them. You can also Google them, okay? The 40B says, I want my Part B. This is only your form. It doesn't go to the employer. And you simply write, there's a section called remarks. You fill out the top part. It's your name, your address, and so on. And you write right in there, SEP special election period so that the government's very clear on what you want 
I want my part B to start. And remember, it always has to start the first of the month. So I'm going to help him with the 40B. He's going to come in on Friday. We're going to have the employer forms. He's going to have his 40B. We're going to fill it out from his card. And then I fax them to the local Social Security office. So that's where they actually get processed. So once they process it, he probably will get a card within a month. He will always retain the Part A date that he had. His Medicare ID number will stay the same. And now in this particular case, his Part B will be dated 11-1. So that's our goal. We don't have a lot of time here to pull it off. But the fact that he's already in the system will definitely be of help, okay? So once you're in the system, you get a brand new card. Get rid of the old one with your Part A only, okay? You got your new Medicare card, and then you're off and running. Now you are going to pay for Part B. You didn't pay for Part B prior to that. So Part A is the hospitalization. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then our Part B are all the medical services. The current monthly premium right now is $164.90 a month, and it is based on your income. So if you go with me to the blue sheet that was on the left-hand side, and it looks just like this, this begins to kind of set the stage for, well, what is this thing called Medicare? It's been around since 1965. Do you remember who the president was in 65? It's got initials, L, B, J. Lyndon Baines Johnson, part of the Great Society, and he said, you know what, wouldn't that be nice, and Congress said, that you would have health insurance when you turn 65. So a lot of people had pensions back then. He said, well, you'll have a pension, you'll also have health insurance. So they started collecting out of a paycheck for Part A. So that is why you don't pay anything for Part A, okay? As long as you've worked 10 years or more and you've been paying into the payroll system, you're good to go with Part A. But the downside is when you look at the blue sheet in front of you, you will see that there is a $1,600 deductible to be admitted to the hospital. So this is just original Medicare. If all you took was Part A and Part B and you added nothing to it, if you went to the hospital, you'd have a $1,600 deductible. So this begins to point out why people look for additional insurance. So when we talk about open enrollment, what's being revisited on October 15 is what's called an Advantage Plan, which is also known as a Part C. So now we've had A, B, C is an Advantage Plan, which we'll talk more about in Part D, which is the prescription drug plan. So that's what's up for grabs now between October 15 and the end of the, or 12-7. So back to the blue sheet. Hospital stay, you can see there's a lot of out-of-pocket the longer you're in the hospital. Quick question? Sure. Yeah, uh, like for me, I'm still on her insurance, mm -hmm. but I have Part A. Mm -hmm. If I go to the hospital, mm -hmm. does the employer's insurance take priority? It does. No, the employer's, good question. Your employer insurance in that situation is still primary. Only if they can't pay, they go to. That is correct. Yes, there may or may not be any benefit to it, but always show them the Part A card. But the group insurance goes first, yes. And then if there's anything left over that would be of any value, then they'll they'll address it with that Medicare Part A card. Okay. Yes. Going back to that calendar. Yes. March sure. But he, he loses his job in January before, say. Okay. He's not 65. Right. So he probably has to get COBRA or something to he, stay in that period. He, he probably either could do COBRA as long as there, I think it's got to be 50 employees. There's a, an amount you have to have. And the other option is short-term medical. So there are a few short-term medical plans. They're no more than six months. There's some law, there's Congress out there that are trying to limit them to three months, but right now there's six. So in that particular case, we use that as kind of a bridging tool because COBRA can still be pretty expensive. So yes, he would get short term for X number of months, and then they will remove him when he turns 65. They won't let him stay on the plan anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
And that person probably also could go to the marketplace for a few months. Nothing says you have to be out there for a year. So that would be another option. So they, he would have a few, maybe Cobra, short term, and even the marketplace. Yeah. Or up to date, or go Cobra because you have three months to bring in. And if they could last those three months and didn't have any bad health, they didn't have to pay any. That is very true. Yep. That is very true. A little bit of a risk because with the other plans, you'd have to have them in place. But you're right. People will look at COBRA and say, I wrote it out. <laughs> I did just fine. Okay. And it would always be your fallback position. It is more expensive. Some of the short term is only a couple hundred dollars. So people have said, you know what? I think I'll just do that. So, and other people have looked at COBRA, of which we had someone not too long ago from, from David Carrier. And he said, I want the dental and vision. He said, and I want to keep that for as long as I can. I've already been paying into the dental with my deductibles and so on. So there can be a lot of reasons for staying where you stay. Yeah. No, oh, good question. Okay. So back to the blue sheet. The blue sheet says, if I go to skilled nursing, it's because I couldn't go home from my hospital stay. And the very first 20 days are going to be paid for by Medicare. If you're still in a skilled nursing facility beyond day 20, now it's day 21, it's going to cost you $200 a day. Is the decision that you can't go home to yours or the hospital's? It's the skilled nursing facility's decision. What is it? It's the rehab's decision. It's the rehab's decision, correct. I mean, I guess you can say I'm ready to go because I want to pay 20 at day 21. But yeah, it's kind of a mutual decision there. And anything beyond day 100 constitutes long-term care. Okay. So generally they do a pretty good job at getting you out at the 20th day because they know that a lot of people don't have additional coverage for days 21 through 100. But that's your part A. So you've been admitted to the hospital. You had a surgical procedure, perhaps it was an emergency. It was not. You had room and board. You had uh, physical therapy, all your medications are covered under that, so on and so forth. So as long as you're under the umbrella of I am an admitted patient, it'll all be billed under Part A. Part B, this is where you're going to pay 20% and Medicare is going to pay 80%. You often hear that and see it in writing where it will say the 80-20 split. So that is a coinsurance. But before that actually kicks into place, at the bottom of the page is what's called a Part B deductible. The Part B deductible this year, and again, all these numbers are due to change, and they probably will go up. This year, it's $226. So it's not $226 a month. It's collectively for the whole year, $226. But they don't prorate it if you come aboard half year into it either. You are responsible for the $226, but only if you seek a medical service they don't just willy-nilly charge you 226. So once you've satisfied the deductible of 226, and it can be a multitude of bills, a couple, then it's subject to the 8020. And then my Part B medical services are, and now I need to go to the doctor. I need physical therapy. I need occupational therapy. I need an MRI. I need a CAT scan, so on and so forth. You're not in the hospital anymore. You've gone home, but you still need some medical services, okay? Also under Part B are all your preventative services. So the ones you know and love today, whether they're mammograms and pap smears and colonoscopies, those are still preventative, and they're under Part B of Medicare, okay? So that is Part A and Part B. Now, what they don't tell you is you do need to do something with your drug plan. So one thing I want to point out over here it's not as big a deal as it used to be. If you sign up for Part A only, and we've got a few folks that have done that or are doing that, the group plan that you have has to have what we call credible drug coverage. So once a year, they are required to send you a letter, and I think they have until the 15th of this month, to make sure that you know that the group plan you are in is as good as or better than the federal government's plan, okay? Hang on to that letter because you may need to prove it when you come aboard fully with Part A and Part B, okay? But the way that it's worded for the prescription drug plan Part D is that if you have A only, 
you have to be able to prove you have credible coverage. Otherwise, the government says, I expect to see you for the Part D. You come see me for the Part D, okay? So that's just a little bit of an aside. So hang on to that. Again, there we are, the, the employer or the insurance company is required to get that in your hands, okay? All right. So this is due to change, but what you need to know is everybody pays for Medicare. This is not Medicaid. Medicaid is for people with lower income. So if you look at the matrix of sorts and it talks about the yearly income. Sure. On B, okay. There's no max. Nope, unlimited. Correct. In terms of original Medicare, this is all you did. You're going to see that there's a maximum over here on the Advantage plan in a minute, but no, not here, okay? So the assumption is when you're on Medicare that you see a doctor that takes Medicare and whatever procedure that you're having done is an eligible procedure for Medicare. Unfortunately, I grabbed my wrong book, but you will get one of these if you don't have one already, and it does a very nice job of explaining what's eligible and what's not. And if you ever wonder, you call them, but you do have to have the codes and you'd have to get that from the doctor and say, okay, these are the codes. Tell me, is it covered? Is it not covered? So part B, everybody pays except those on Medicaid. And if you look at the yearly income, they will always look two years back. So if I was coming aboard in 2023, they're gonna look at the income of 2021 if you file jointly, your income would be less than one ninety four, hundred ninety four thousand dollars or less, and that's where the one hundred and sixty four dollars and ninety cents comes into play. Remember, it's per person and it's per month. If you file as a single person, currently the threshold is at ninety seven thousand dollars. Remember, every year they will evaluate this for you. Okay, so. It's not too long. We're going to know what 2024 looks like, and they're going to be looking at people's 2022 income tax, okay? There also is the ability, without going into a lot of explanation, but once in a while, I'll get somebody who was working, and then they're not working anymore, so their income has declined. And they, they look at it, and they go, wait a minute. The government looked at this. I'm not even working anymore. They're looking at the wrong tax year. The government is willing to look one year back instead of two. And there is a form that you fill out and you give them justification as to whether or not they're going to make an, uh, uh, a change for you. And I did have a couple that had happened not too long ago. And she was like, high praises, Nance. Thank you. Thank you. Because they did retroactively go back and she got quite a few thousand dollars back. So there is a form, no guarantees, but we fill it out. I give it to you and you send it into Social Security and they will adjust it or at least evaluate it. Is it that if you're applying for the in 2023, they're going to look at your 2021, go back two years, mm -hmm. and look at that income for that one year. Correct. Base, 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 Correct. And then they're going to turn right around because it is the end of the year, and then they're going to look at 2022 because it's almost January. And then they do send you a letter and they will say, you know, we now have looked at your, because my husband and I are both on Medicare. So in December, we'll get a letter and it will say, this is where you are for next year. And we're like, ooh, really? Okay. But what they did is they looked at the 2022 tax year. So they always look at it every year unless you say, wait a minute, I think I got an exception here because I'm not working anymore and my income declined, okay? But we'll go through that with you if you have more questions. Okay, so there's my 2023 cost sheet. Know that if your income was more than these numbers that I just shared, those are what we call higher income beneficiaries and they will pay more. So not only do they pay $230.80, because their income was between 194 and 246, those folks get to flip the page over and you will see that they have to pay more for their prescription drug part D. And they don't even get a drug plan. All they do is they get <laughs> the ability to pay more. So I have a friend that calls it a penalty and I'm like, well, call it what you want. But if you make more, the government's gonna take more for your part B and more for your part D as well. 
and it doesn't even get you a drug plan, okay? So in order to have any additional insurance, you have to have Part A and Part B. So this is called Original Medicare, okay? Now we're going to go to the pink sheet, and we're going to draw a little bit of a distinction here between what your choices are. So the best way I would describe this is everybody has to have A and B. And this is how I get paid. I forgot to tell you. I do get paid. <laughs> and the way that I get paid is if you come to me and say, I'd like you to help me. And we can find supplemental plans that will fill the gaps or the out-of-pocket or the holes or whatever it is you want to call it in the original Medicare. What I do, I think that's different is I will help you on the front end with the enrollment because I have the social security forms. I have a person at social security that's my go-to if I have questions. Once we get that satisfied, then we start to talk about how are we gonna fill the gaps? Because it's pretty expensive if you go to the hospital and all you have is original Medicare Part A and Part B. And I have had that. I had a husband called not too long ago. He was estranged from his wife and he's like I can't believe it she never did anything she never did anything above and beyond and here she was in the hospital having a leg amputated so it cost him $1,600 whether she was there day one or day 60 because it is based on a benefit period so it gets pretty pricey if you don't recognize the fact that you can add other insurance to it that's how I get paid every agent receives the same amount so don't think by going here or going with this company that there's any difference in terms of how we get paid. The government every year sets the, stip sets the amount of what it is that we get paid, okay? So that's how that works. And there's just a level playing field. Nobody gets any bit more. We all get the very same thing. So then it really boils down to who's going to help you, who's going to be with you in the long run when you have questions, and I'm independent, which means that I have at least 10 different insurance companies with 70 different plans. So we have, an, I know it's a lot. So we have the opportunity to compare for you and we listen to you. And when you say this is really important, we might go this way or we might go that way. So, um, so the Advantage plan has a flat fee this year of $601 if you come aboard, okay? The next year, if you stay with me, I get half of that, okay? I don't know. I don't remember what the new rate is next year, 610, something like that. And then you get half for the renewal, okay? The drug Part D, I think I get $80, $80 for it. And then if a person renews it, you get half of that for the next year, okay? The Medigap carrier, which we'll talk a little bit about, pays us based on a percentage, so if your premium was $100 and they said you get 23%, every agent would get 23%, I'd get $23. So yes, pretty much. Yep. Can this plan pay you more? Than yes, it can. Money? And you know what? <laughs> I mean, is there an incentive for you to... No, and I... No, because I really pride myself in being impartial. So um, would I make more money on one side? I would, but I could show you that I don't because my mix is probably the Advantage plan. I have about 60% people there and 40% are on the Medigap. And there are very specific reasons why these people are on the Medigap. I'm not going to talk them into the Advantage plan. And you do need to be concerned about that because that's all the stuff you get in the mail. They just keep talking advantage, 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 advantage. Now, I'm not saying it's not a good choice, okay? It's one of two choices, but I want you to be informed when you make that decision, okay? The Medicare Advantage plan is what we call managed care, and it's been around for about 20 years, okay? And it is one-stop shopping. We'll talk a little more about it. But it is through the insurance company. They are going to manage your care. It doesn't mean it's good, bad, or indifferent, okay? It's just a different way of approaching your out-of-pocket, okay? Whereas, and again, let me go through that. But to answer your question, I guess hypothetically, yes, I could look at it and tell you I make more money on 
option number two. I do, but I don't operate that way. No. So A and B, everybody's got it, okay? Part A, zero. Right now, all I can work with is the numbers that I have today. So 164.90, I showed you where the number came from. If a person is interested in an approach such as this one here, they are adding two more cards to their wallet. So they are adding a Medigap card, otherwise known as a Medicare supplement that kind of gets into the language. And they are adding a Part D, which is your drug plan, okay? The drug plan is what's up for renewal right now. So we're spending a lot of time on what are the new plans. We get a list of your medications. We run them through our grid and we say either stay the course and this is the reason why, or no, we think you would be better served in a different plan. These plans, believe it or not, next year, the lowest price premium is zero. They have never had a zero premium Part D plan, literally zero. So good candidates here are going to be people that don't take any medications because when you sign up for Medicare, you have to have a drug plan or you will be penalized down the road. There is a penalty for not signing up. So this will be perfect for the guy, the girl that says, you know, I don't take any anyway. And I'll say, well, this is perfect then because we'll put you in this one and the government will give you credit for being in a plan. They go right on up to about 100, I'll say 110, okay? And the reason for that is these tend to be brand name drugs. They're much more expensive. Somebody's got some other kinds of, you know, critical kinds of things where they're going to be paying more. And this is where you see tiers like tier one, two, three, four, five. Tier one and two tend to be generic and tier three and four tend to be the more expensive ones. But we do the analysis here for these people. We ask them what their drugs are. We come back with a recommendation. So I'm going to tell you that on average, this probably goes for about 35 a month. And then you have co-pays. And then some of the plans have deductibles that you have to first satisfy. So, but it's an, it's an animal in and of itself with a whole bunch of different carriers and so on and so forth. The Medigap plan, what's important about this one is that when you are first eligible, either when you turn 65 or you come aboard after you're no longer working, there are no medical questions asked, but only the first time. So it's what we call guarantee issue. Guarantee issue says, you know what? You can walk through that door, and I've had it. People will come in and they're on oxygen. They're telling me that they're getting dialysis. They're being treated for cancer. They need to know that this might be the choice that they want to make. Doesn't mean they have to stay in it forever, but they also will be covered with all the out-of-pocket that exists over here. So the Medigap plan, I don't think I have a, an example here, but just imagine a matrix where you pick a letter and it inserts itself into all of the out-of-pocket that's over here, okay? So I happen to have a Medigap plan G. Doesn't matter who I, I doesn't matter who it's with. There's lots of different carriers out there. So the plan that I picked said I have to pay the deductible first. It's the only thing the plan doesn't pay for. So in my particular case, I go to Medicare is my primary insurance. Then I have a secondary insurance, okay? And the secondary insurance is a is plan G. So if I went to the hospital, my plan G pays the whole 1600. If I go to the doctor, once I've satisfied the 226, I don't pay the 20%. Okay. So virtually all of the out of pocket that's over here, with the exception of the 226 is covered. So it inserts itself in the gaps. Now, it also costs something. And the cost over here starts at when you turn 65, it starts at about $100 for a female, and it starts at about $120 for a male, okay? That's per month. But it inserts itself and fills all the gaps. So somebody who says, you know, I like peace of mind, I got a lot of health issues, I have some family concerns, they may want to start here because they won't be asked any questions. If they don't start here, they go with the Medigap, Advantage plan, which is very, very popular, otherwise known as 
part C, if they start here, they may not be able to go here because they just used their freebie. They didn't take it. They went over here and this is where they first started. So it is important, okay? It's much easier to start here if you're not sure and you can always go here, okay? So last year I had 45 people, they had this and they all said, we wanna go here. We wanna evaluate that. And all of them have stayed here, okay? Because I've called them and said, all right, what's it like? I know you saved some money. You told me you didn't go to the doctor very much. You didn't want to keep paying $100 a month plus $35 for your Part D over here. How'd you do over here? And they're like, I'm loving it, okay? But it's two different approaches. So the approach over here with the Advantage Plan, and that's what's up for renewal right now, is that you get the medical, you get the prescription drug. It's all built into one card and one plan. And then you get what I would guess I'd call value added. So what is the medical? All right. Well, you knew over here if you went to the hospital, it was $1,600. A lot of the plans over here have a copay of right in the neighborhood of $300. I'll use that as an average, okay? So you go to the hospital. It's based on the number of days that you're there. Let's say that the maximum was six and you were there for 10. So you're going to pay six times 300. So you owe the plan $1,800, okay? And the plan will pick up the balance of the days. So they'll pick up day seven, eight, nine, and 10, okay? Now, let me back up and tell you that why these are real popular is that this is more like a group plan. What's not like a group plan is that the premium is zero. That's what's being advertised today. So think of this as, yes, you have virtually no copay or virtually no premium, it's zero, but you pay for every medical service with the exception of the primary care. So back to my medical, I need to go to a specialist. Okay, there's 45 bucks. I need to go to the hospital. There's 325, I was there only one night. I needed an MRI, now it's 290. Oh, I need physical therapy. I hurt my arm. I got $30. I needed 10 visits, okay? So it's going to add up. Doesn't mean it's going to add up to the amount you spent over here, but you're kind of anticipating, okay, what do I know about myself? What am I going to be most comfortable about? And you asked about the maximum out of pocket. The average, and that's all I can talk to right here because they're plan specific, is about $5,000 per person per year. And it's very rare anybody hits this. If they do, they've been very sick for the year. They probably have had cancer. They had surgeries. They had a lot of out-of-pocket expense in terms of back and forth to the doctor. So they might have an awful year. But the next year, they might just have a couple of visits over here. And that may be the extent of it. So that's kind of what you're looking at. Now, what's important here, though, is that your doctors participate in the plan. So we have what we call HMOs and PPOs. Sure. So this is where I Okay, let's clarify. Uh, the Advantage plan, that's through an insurance company. It is. The Medigap is the one I'm here to the government. Is that right? No. So this, everybody has to start here. This is the government's insurance, okay? Yeah. Yep. So the Medigap carrier, okay, could be the same as the Advantage Plan carrier, okay? So over here, these are private insurance companies, Mutual of Omaha, Transamerica, AARP, um, Greek Catholic Union. There's probably 35 different carriers. Private insurance companies, okay? It's added to this. It doesn't replace it. It's added to because it inserts itself into the out-of-pocket. Okay, does that help? Kind of. Yes, AARP would be United Healthcare. They're the biggest provider of a Medigap supplement. Send you lots of information. Yep. Yep. So what can be tricky is people will say, well, I don't pay anything. And this guy here says, wow, man, I've been paying a hundred and whatever, right? And they both have Priority Health or they both have Blue Cross or they both have Humana, okay? So the key question is to the one that says, I don't pay anything, what do you pay to go to the hospital? And he goes, oh, that's right. I pay $300. Well, the other guy says, well, I don't pay anything, okay? Pay me now, pay me later. 
more like a group plan. I'm going to pay as I go. I'm going to be comfortable with it. I'm going to know my doctors participate. And the beauty of this, and people like this, is the value added. So now I get preventative dental, vision, and hearing. You don't have that on this side. I get a gym membership over here. I don't have that, although there's a couple plans that have gyms, but all of them have silver sneakers. You might have heard of that. The gym membership resides. And they have over-the-counter benefits where you get a debit card and you go into the Walgreens or the Walmart. Yeah, well, you don't have that on this side. I mean, this is straight Medicare. Original Medicare, I added a Medigap. I added a prescription drug plan. This is my coverage, but I have to pay extra for dental, vision, and hearing. Why Medicare doesn't include preventative, I don't know why. I mean, they tried to get it to be a covered benefit. It doesn't make sense to me. Now, if you have a medical need like cataract surgery, that is covered under Part B if it was done as an outpatient. So my husband, Ron, last week had cataract surgery. That isn't preventative. That was medical, okay? So you have to know, is it medical that it's covered? But if it's preventative, it's because I can't see as well. I'm getting a little older, my teeth, whatever. That's preventative. And you'll be best satisfied over here. But you got to be okay with the out-of-pocket expense. You have to be okay with the network. In most of the carriers, they have a lot of participation with a lot of doctors. They do. And part of my job is to look them all up. Okay. You gave me three doctors. I got to see whether they participate with this carrier, that carrier, so on and so forth. And then we make a recommendation on the doctors. We also look up your prescriptions to make sure that they're covered in the plan. There is something called the donut hole. I'm not going to go into a lot of explanation about it today. But if you take expensive meds, it's something that we need to talk about. The government is making some changes, good ones, I think, coming in the next couple of years, where like in 2025, they are going to limit how much someone could spend on their medications to $2,000. I mean, I have clients that spend three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 on really expensive stuff, okay? So I think we're going to see some good changes as a result of that. What you don't know is the good changes They're going to negotiate with the drug plans and the companies and the pharmaceuticals. How is it going to come back to us? It may be that we have a lower copay, but what is it going to do to the premium? I mean, is there some other way that it's going to come back around? So, yes. Well, then, when I'm trying to evaluate the home insurance companies, there'll be a difference between what their advantage plan is, which is right this is the advantage. Yeah, their part C plan no, this is part C. Okay, so, so where you get the other side? Right here. Yeah, but where, where does that come from? What am I looking at to get a Medigap? So you is have to, you have to, the government? No, it's government? through a private insurance company. Right. So what's the difference between the advantage plan and the Medigap? So the Medigap costs more. Yeah, but what are they terming it? When, when I'm looking at priority health information, oh, Medigap, they'll, that's what they'll it, it will they'll say call it it, they'll call it a Medicare it's supplement. C, it'll be oh no, Medicare. if they're calling it Part C, you're over here. You know that for a fact. Okay. So they're going to call it either a Medicare supplement or they're going to most likely call it a Medigap Plan G or oh, Plan yeah, N, right, or Plan F, right? Yep. Did you say if you go with Part D, you cannot get added value in dental and vision? No, there, there's no dental and vision over here. So on your sheet, does this get x So on the left-hand side? There's a cost. No, there's a cost. So we'd fill in the blank for you. You can get it as a separate plan, right? It's not embedded in the plan. So where is over here? It's embedded into the plan, okay? Yep, good question. But yes, you can get it. I have dental plans. I have a couple of vision plans. Hearing is kind of hard to find. Over the counter, no, I don't have that. And I don't have a health club. So can't help with that. It is. This is a month. Yep. And that came right from that base right here. Correct. But it is per month per person. Yep. So if two of you were on, it's times two. And if you were a higher income beneficiary, it's the higher number times two because you jointly 
filed your taxes. Okay. All right. Okay. Does this clear it up a little bit anyway? All right. Okay. I just need to out, like when they come at me with, but this plan is this and this plan is that. I don't know which one. The biggest, the biggest factor is going to be what does it cost? Yeah. So if somebody tells you it costs a hundred dollars, they're on this side. If somebody says I can get it to you for zero or a very small amount, they're on this side. If somebody calls it a Part C, they're on this side. You just have to decide which you want to pay up front, or you want. To That's pay exactly up. right. That's exactly right. And and Medigap is usually someone who we already know had, you know, who maybe isn't as healthy. Maybe it's that. I told you for those of you that. Stuff. Well, this once will a year. once a year it's going to go up. I picked this one because I had breast cancer, and I thought I want the best plan. I may not stay here and my premium does go up and it's very reasonable. But I said, I want the best plan. I want to go where I want to go doctor wise, as long as they take Medicare. If I want to go to the Cleveland clinic or the Mayo clinic, I want to go. Okay. If that's what I want to do, you'd be a little hard pressed to go to the Mayo clinic or the Cleveland clinic over here. They're not real fans of the advantage plan. Doesn't mean it's a reason to do it or not do it. That's good. No, because I'm in the same place. Great. It has been cancer free for a long time, but guess what? I'll probably die of it's cancer. You, you don't know. That's don't right. Know, but yeah, I've already had it. So it's it, It's of consideration. Okay. And that's why I did this. Now, so the Medicare, you, can't, you can get a set amount every month, but they, you don't have all the copays. That's exactly that. right. Or is that an 80 20 month? No, it covers it all. The only thing I have is my 226, and I just satisfied that. And if you sign up for that, then you're good to go for Advantage Plan later. Is that Always can get here as long as you do it during the time of the year. You might not be able to answer the medical questions, right? That is correct. That is correct. Okay. Does it help? Because it's an important factor. Right. If you start off on Medigap, you think life is going to be strong. Okay. That is correct. If you started here yeah. and you went here, yeah. there's actually what they call a trial right. So I had a few people ask about what does that mean? If you start here and you want to try this, they will let you come back in 12 months if you change your mind, but not in thir- uh huh. But without. But 13 months, months you're, you're, you're back over here answering the question. It's a one-time deal. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. I had somebody ask me about that today. She wants, she wants to try this. I know every year she calls me and she says, Oh, all my buddies are going over here. They keep saying, why should I spend all the money over here? I said, well, let's try it. So she can try it. And if she changes her mind, she will automatically go back and they have to take her no medical questions. And they'll actually go back at maybe a lesser rate because here's what happens over here. This is a little bit, maybe they would disagree, but it's a little bit like the cable company. They gotcha, right? So unless you go back, you can always revisit it. Okay. And I did, I already revisited mine one and said, I'm healthy. I'm not going with the rate increase you just gave me. You go back to the drawing board. I went back with the same company and I said, look, and I can answer all the questions. No, I don't want that rate increase. So I got the lower rate. So you can always revisit this. And as we just said, if you went from here to here, as long as you come back in 12 months, they have to take you at the going rate of whatever your age is. But if you go to the diagnosed with bad stage pancreatic. Right. Your costs are going to be advantaged. You can't say, okay, I'm going back. Well, you could if it's 12 months, yes. And, and not pay all the expenses. Mm-hmm. I did have somebody. So she she was here and she had had cancer and, and she was doing great. And she said, I wanted the health club. All of her friends were going to the health club and she was in good shape. Well, then the cancer came back. And she's, and I reminded her, I said, remember, you have a trial, right? If you feel more comfortable with the care on this side and the doctors and how everything's going to go through the system, then we can still move you. So we evaluated both sides. That choice when they say, okay, your bill is going to be X thousand dollars. 
Well, you wouldn't get the bill at that point. You would have moved prior to that. So if you had a diagnosis, you would say to yourself, do I want to stay in the same health insurance plan I have? That is exactly right. No, you would have to move, and they all generally start the first of the month. So she evaluated, she stayed. She was fine. She stayed here, and she did pass away. But that's an option with the 12 months, okay? Yep, yep. But no, you couldn't do the services. You'd have to move and then do the surgery or whatever. Yep. Okay. So that's a little bit there. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit more about open enrollment, and then we're going to kind of table it for today. You got a good education here. So we are revisiting people's prescription drug plans, okay? And we are revisiting people's Part Cs. That's what's taking place right now. And we're also helping people who are turning 65 and quitting at the end of the year with their jobs. We got a little bit of everything. But if you were already in Medicare, these are the things that we try to encourage people. It's under mistakes to avoid. And all it really is, it's kind of common sense, but here we go. Some people do nothing. So what happens is they get what's called an annual notice of change from the carrier that they currently have their Part D with or they currently have their Part C with, and they don't look at it. And then they go, oh, my, look at that thing double. And if they wait till after 12, 7, they're stuck with that double premium. So we really encourage people, look at you got to look at the material that the carrier sends you. And you have to decide whether you want to stay or whether you want to go. So both sides, they send a lot of information. They'll tell you what the new premium is, what some of the other drug changes are, et cetera, et cetera. So biggest mistake is to do nothing. It might be that you do nothing, but please look at it and decide you're going to do nothing. Not understanding the enrollment. I showed you that we have enrollment periods. This is called the annual election period. It must happen between the 15th and the 7th of December. If you ever have an Advantage plan and you move outside the state of Michigan, then you do get a special election for having moved to Florida they will allow you to make a change because an Advantage plan is based on where you live. So your Advantage plan that you bought in the state of Michigan is not going to work in Ohio, and it's not going to work in California. You have to find another plan. They give you 60 days to go find another Advantage plan. You're looking confused? Yeah, this one you can go anywhere in the 50 United States and move. Yes. Yep, it's portable. Snowbird, good question. They both have a travel component, okay? So if you're on the Advantage plan, the Snowbird, who's in wherever, if he walks into the emergency room, it's $110 next year in most plans. It would be $110 in Florida. So it's the same for emergency care and urgent care. If you needed to go see a dermatologist and it wasn't an emergency, one, they'd have to take you as a new patient, right? Two, they'd have to be accepting Medicare. And three, you might have to call the plan to just kind of pave the way because a lot of the plans will say you have the same coverage even for your day-to-day care, okay? But once in a while, you show the card to the doctor in Florida that's a dermatologist and they'll go, well, I never heard of Priority Health, you know? Now, they probably heard of Blue Cross and they probably heard of Humana, But the smaller regional carrier, they're like, I'm not taking priority health. I might not get paid, right? So we have to work through those issues. But a lot of the plans are designed where the copays are the same. Now, if you go outside the network, it isn't that you pay 100%, but you won't get the full value of the $45 copay. You might pay a percentage of the doctor's bill, so it could cost you more. So on this side, yeah, you do need to understand, are you in the network or out of the network? You understand that you have a maximum here. The maximum here does not include the drugs. It only includes the medical portion of the plan. So this is what goes into the maximum out of pocket. The other thing that people get confused about here is they think sometimes they have to spend the first 5000 like it's a deductible. Uh Uh-uh. It's from dollar one. So if this is my plan, and I paid zero, and I went to the primary care doctor, most of them are all zero. When I start going to a specialist, now I hit 35 to 45 a visit, and so on and so forth, okay? All right, Um, 
mistake number three, not considering the out-of-pocket expenses. Well, you can see you're going to have them here. And you're going to have some dental, vision, and hearing ones over here. I mean, those, it's all part of the big picture as far as what makes the most sense for you. Mistake four, not understanding your plan and its costs. So when you sit down with us, if you come and see us, it's generally two appointments. The first one is we get to know each other. We help you with the A and B. If you don't have Medicare, we start to show you your plan selections, okay? And then the second appointment is generally the closing appointment where we're going to help along with you. What direction do you want to go? We're going to show you multiple carriers here. Some of them give you a discount for being married, okay? We're going to show you a couple of plans here if need be. Otherwise, some of them are very straightforward. We recommend X, Y, Z. And some people, they come in and they're still undecided. They're like, I don't know which way. And then we have a crystal ball, literally. We do. <laughs> no, but we help you work. Through it. <laughs> but it is. It's a crystal ball. So we help you decide. So that's why I think, too, it's important with the second appointment because we're going to give you information and it's your homework. So it's like, okay, I got to digest this. I got to pay attention. I got to have questions. I got to understand what it is that I'm doing because it is an important decision, especially this one, if your health is kind of uncertain. Okay. All right. Coming in for a close here. Mistake number five, expecting your health to remain the same. We all know that. We've all seen that. Right? I had a scare about a month ago. One mammogram, two mammograms. Nope, we need to do a breast biopsy. And I'm like, oh my Lord, please don't make me go through this again. It turned out fine. But you know, it can happen at any time. We've all seen it our own selves, our family. So, got to have the best plan in mind with contingencies. Mistake six, not maximizing your plan's value. And yeah, there's a lot of value added over here. So we even once a year will invite everybody that has an Advantage plan and we'll go through and say, do you know how to use the over-the-counter card? Because some people don't even know they have one. Do you know that you have a gym membership? Oh, where can I go? Can I go in Florida there? But yeah, so we help people maximize the value added benefits here as well. Okay. So I'm coming in for a landing. The other thing would be if anybody has more expensive drugs, this particular worksheet simply shows you what the progression will be. When the donut hole and all of that came into play, it was in the year 2006. And in the year 2006, if you spent a certain amount of money on your drugs, you ended up in the coverage gap or the donut hole, and you literally paid 100%. Keep in mind that every drug has a retail price. So if my Eloquist is $400, that's what goes into the calculation towards the donut hole. You didn't pay 400 but the government says that's how we're going to count it towards our calculations. You might have only paid $42, okay? So it's kind of a convoluted way of how they look at drugs if you have drugs, it's always a good idea to understand it, and we will walk you through that. But when the drug plan was rolled out, they did not have the ability to negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies. Why they never did that, I don't know. But this Inflation Reduction Act that's been out there for a year simply said, we will negotiate, <laughs> and you will negotiate, Mr. Drug Company. So now they have identified the top drugs. They've got 10 of them, one of which is Eliquis is at the top of the list. There's a lot of people on that blood thinner. And they're going to do everything that they can to start to bring some of the costs down because people sometimes have to decide, not, not as much as they used to, do I have to decide between eating or getting my medication? Because that Eliquis sometimes goes from 42, 42, 42, and all of a sudden now it goes to 142. Well, that's another $100 when you're living on a fixed income. That's a lot of money for somebody. So that's basically what it shows you there. Insulin is $35. Insulin products, those have been out there for the last two years. Not the pills, but simply the ones where, you know, you got the pens and the vials and that type of thing. So they're making inroads there. Um, this picture here is the four of us as far as our team. If you put, on, put a face with a name, if you come to see us, you'll either meet with myself, Kristen, or Amy. Becca is our back office person. She's been on board a couple of months, so she's learning the ropes, and it's her first open enrollment. 
And she's like, ah, I don't really know what to expect. What do you think? And I'm like, just hold on, girl, because here we go, because it is busy. So my offer is if at some point in time it makes sense for us to get together, if it doesn't have to be during open enrollment, that would be appreciated. But if you're getting ready to retire or you got to make some decisions, we will definitely make, make a way for you, okay? And you just need to fill out the sheet that had the evaluation form, indicate you want an appointment, and we will call you, or you can call us too, but I can never reach out to you without your permission, just so that you know that, okay? So I've gone over a few minutes. Any other questions that anybody has? Yeah. Yes, okay. Hypothetical situation. She's 36 to 5. She's still working. I'm on a mm head. -hmm. She gets a notice that you're no longer on. Mm -hmm. What kind of a window? So assume it's not to October to December. Mm -hmm. What kind of a window do we have before we would incur penalties for, for not getting C and D in time? Well, you're going to want to get your Part B because you don't have it. And I, you could do that in the comp and you can accomplish that in 45 days. So 45 to 60 days. So that will give you time to get it. But there's, there's nothing that says if you don't get your C and D by like, isn't there a 10% penalty for life? If you don't do it within that. So you're talking about, and so what, so this is, you would have what we call an SCP. So the first thing you would have to do is get your A and B, right? Yeah. So you're going to allow yourself 45 to 60 days. And then you're going to have requested a date over here. And then your C and D comes right behind it. We can request the same day for the same day for the C and D. It will correspond with this. So, you know, the guy I told you about, he's only got a couple weeks, right? I mean, he's over here and he's going for this. So you could have that. Like you say, a lot of the employers will cover you through the end of the month. I mean, if they were to lay you off, a lot of them will cover you. Or you always have COBRA, but you don't want to keep COBRA too long when you're entitled to Medicare. Because sometimes the Medicare makes more sense in terms of the coverage. And there are rules with that. So you got a period of time. The, you're going to go get your Part B. You're going to tell them I want 11-1. And then you're going to come and see me. In the meantime, back here, let's say it was October 1st, so you gave yourself 30 days. We fill out the paperwork, we get the ball rolling for A and B, you come and see me and we go through C and D, we fill out the paperwork, you get your card or you get confirmation that you have your B, okay? So online, after you have sent the paperwork in that I talked about, you can actually get into your Social Security account and it will show the status of your Part B. It will give you steps. This is where we are in the processing of your Part B. Did I answer your question? Sorry. Okay. If they got forbid something happened to you and we couldn't do it as quickly as we anticipated, is there a time when the government says, no, you didn't do it by this date, you're not going to be penalized? Well, for your B or for your C and D? Okay. For your C and D. Um you probably would run into where you'd have to wait for the open enrollment for October, November, and December, and then it wouldn't start till January 1st. But no, there, like there's there's no penalty. Isn't there normally, for, for maybe it's just the, a 10, if you don't do it by a certain date, 10% penalty the rest of your life? Well, this one is 63 days. You get 63 days from the paperwork date to sign up. Yeah, so I see what you're saying. With And it's only this one right here. It is 63 days. Yeah, yeah. But if you fell outside of this, you'd probably end up in, you got to wait till January 1st. And then you would do it during the annual election period. Without and, the lifetime penalty. Right. But you're right about the D. You don't want to let that go beyond 63 days. They don't always assign it, and it, it's 1% for every month that you didn't sign up. It's not 10, it's 1. So it would be a small increment, but to avoid it altogether, 63 days from the paperwork date that says this is when your insurance was ending. Yep, yep, 63 days. Okay, thank you very much. A lot of little nuances and this, that, and whatever, and moving parts, but... 
We thank you all. And um, that concludes it. Again, please fill out your evaluation form. Give us a call. We have an email. And um, for those of you on Medicare, have a blessed annual election period. Thank you. <laughs>